Fragmentos incorpora las voces de mujeres víctimas de violencia sexual que participaron en la obra Dando Forma al Piso. Miranda Fricker también es profesora de investigaciones en filosofía en la Universidad de Sheffield, en Inglaterra. Es doctora en filosofía diplomada de Oxford y tiene un postdoctorado de la Universidad de Londres. Fue jefe del Departamento de Filosofía de Birkbeck College en Londres y fue elegida miembro de la prestigiosa British Academy en 2016. Es autora de dos libros, La vida epistémica de grupos y Injusticia epistémica, que existe en español y es coautora de un libro sobre el feminismo y la filosofía. Antes de escuchar a Miranda Fricker, vamos a dar la voz a Luderlina Pérez Carvajal, víctima de violencia sexual durante el conflicto. En 2001, cuando tenía 16 años, fue abusada sexualmente por guerrilleros FARC y en 2004 fue violentada de nuevo por hombres armados de las Autodefensas Unidas de Colombia. En 2009 fundó la organización la Asociación de Mujeres Víctimas del Conflicto Gestionando Paz, que prestan acompañamiento jurídico y psicológico a las mujeres víctimas de violencia sexual y a sus hijos. Han ayudado más de 5.000 mujeres. Luderlina recibió el premio de la Mujer CAFAM en 2019. Eh, quiero presentarles a Alessia Schiavón, directora de programas de la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones, que han muy generosamente apoyado este evento esta noche. Muchas gracias. Buena, buenas tardes para todos y todas. Uh, un saludo a los representantes de las instituciones públicas, organizaciones internacionales, cuerpo diplomático, comunidad académica y sociedad civil. Y una muy especial bienvenida a las niñas y adolescentes del comité consultivo que nos acompañan el día de hoy. Bienvenidos a todos. Los esfuerzos para alcanzar la paz en Colombia han planteado el desafío de fortalecer acciones por los derechos de las víctimas de violencia sexual, particularmente de las niñas y de las mujeres que han vivido los crueles impactos del conflicto armado. Bajo este contexto, es clara la necesidad de, se de seguir consolidando alianzas conjuntas para promover la visibilidad de los hechos victimizantes, trabajar para asegurar la no repetición y construir mecanismos de reconocimiento y reparación para restituir los derechos vulnerados. Es importante reconocer los avances que en Colombia se han dado en esta materia, en el marco de la Ley de Víctimas, y sobre todo por los esfuerzos de las de la iniciativas lideradas por las mismas víctimas. Un ejemplo de ellos nos congrega aquí hoy, en este lugar símbolo de la memoria, Uh, un espacio en donde se plasma la lucha y la fuerza de las mujeres víctimas de violencia sexual en el marco del conflicto en Colombia. La Organización Internacional para las Migraciones reitera su compromiso de seguir acompañando a sus diferentes actores que vienen trabajando en la garantía de los derechos de las víctimas. En esta línea, la OIM ha venido apoyando esta iniciativa, este ciclo de conferencias académicas, para que podamos tener un espacio conjunto de reflexión y de debate y de discusión con expertos y representantes de diferentes sectores con amplia trayectoria y de experiencia en estos temas. Es un honor dejarlos uh, con Doris Salcedo, con uh, Ludirlena Pérez Carvajal y con la profesora Miranda Fricker, tres mujeres que nos inspiran con su experiencia, con su trabajo y que lideran y que liderarán el resto de este evento. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Alesia. Ahora voy a dar la palabra a Doris Salcedo, la artista que conceptualizó fragmentos y que va a introducir a Luderlina y a Miranda en sus propias palabras. Buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por su presencia hoy acá y sean muy, muy bienvenidos. Iniciamos hoy un ciclo de conferencias eh, motivados por la convicción de que toda acción violenta debe ser calificada y juzgada 
desde la perspectiva de la víctima. El objetivo con este tipo de eventos es propiciar el encuentro entre la experiencia de la víctima, de todas las víctimas y la filosofía. Quisiéramos señalar que la marginalidad, la discriminación, la inequidad, no solo se expresan en la injusticia económica, social y política, sino que ante todo se basan en lo que Miranda Fricker ha denominado injusticia testimonial. Con este ciclo de charlas queremos formular preguntas complejas que nos ayuden a comprender por qué llevamos tantos años sumidos en un ciclo aparentemente interminable e imparable de violencia fratricida. Decidimos iniciar este ciclo con la conferencia de Miranda Fricker, confesando, titulada Confesando la injusticia testimonial, porque es esencial preguntarnos aquí, en Colombia, hoy, ¿quién es escuchado en nuestra sociedad y quién no? ¿Quién logra comunicar su experiencia y por qué motivo? ¿A quién se le cree cuando da testimonio? ¿Quién es reconocido como interlocutor válido en nuestro medio? Esta, desafortunadamente, es una sociedad en la que el testimonio de la víctima ha sido ignorado durante muchísimos años. Es claro que esta estrategia ha permitido la continuación de la violencia. Para dar solo un ejemplo, recordemos que frente al testimonio que daban las madres de Suacha, las madres de los mal llamados falsos positivos, se argumentaba desde la presidencia de la República que, comillas, esos muchachos no iban a recoger café, cierro comillas. Se inserta la duda acerca del comportamiento de la víctima y así se justifica la acción del victimario. El sentido generado por unas personas se impone y destruye el derecho de las víctimas a contar su verdad. Durante muchos años en Colombia, las víctimas han perdido sus voces porque nuestra sociedad impone unas condiciones de extrema injusticia hermenéutica y epistemológica. Las mujeres víctimas de violencia sexual, las minorías étnicas, los habitantes de zonas marginales, los campesinos han sido invisibilizados y su testimonio han sido considerados inaudibles. Hemos invitado a Miranda Fricker porque en su libro Injusticia epistemológica, poder y ética del conocimiento, ella revela una dimensión ética de la epistemología. Ella, en este libro, acuña el término injusticia testimonial para referirse al perjuicio que una persona que escucha le causa a la persona que da testimonio, al negarle credibilidad a la experiencia que esta persona narra. La injusticia testimonial es una expresión de poder, y por eso en nuestro medio estará siempre conectada a un acto de violencia política. No obstante, son las víctimas con sus actos valerosos quienes superan en Colombia la injusticia testimonial. Por cierto, hace unos días fuimos informados acerca de un hecho violento que desafortunadamente ocurre con inusitada frecuencia en Colombia. El excombatiente de las FARC, Dimar Torres, fue asesinado el pasado 22 de abril en zona rural de convención. Conocimos la noticia de este hecho tristemente repetitivo gracias a un evento absolutamente extraordinario. La comunidad de convención dio testimonio de lo ocurrido. Comunicaron lo que vieron y experimentaron con total lucidez, claridad y contundencia. Personas a quienes normalmente nuestra sociedad se niega, niega su derecho a hablar alzaron su voz y su testimonio tuvo que ser aceptado por las autoridades que pretendían, como siempre, desconocerlos. Este fue un hecho extraordinario. Otro hecho extraordinario es el trabajo de Ludirlena Pérez Carvajal, quien hoy también nos acompaña. Ella, al igual que la comunidad de convención, decidió desobedecer, decidió desobedecer las normas interpretativas impuestas a sangre y fuego aquí en Colombia durante esta guerra. Ludirlena fue víctima de varios actores armados y de múltiples crímenes. En forma admirable, ha transformado su experiencia traumática en fuente de sanación para 5.038 víctimas. 
su caso, es un ejemplo de, que como, de cómo cuando un ser sometido decide hablar y reclama su capacidad para generar sentido, este ser deja de ser sometido y se convierte en un agente de transformación social. Por eso, quiero agradecer la presencia de Miranda y de Ruiz Rena y de todos ustedes aquí para que logremos hacernos las preguntas pertinentes que nos permitan abrir el camino hacia la reconciliación. Muchas gracias. Muy buenas noches. Un saludo especial para todos los asistentes y también un agradecimiento especial a la Red de Mujeres Víctimas y Profesionales por permitirme el día de hoy venir a compartir de mi testimonio de vida. Como lo decían, soy Ludirlena Pérez Carvajal, víctima de dos hechos de violencia sexual, uno a mis 16 años por el Frente 23 de las FARC. En este suceso iba con una compañera de estudio y las dos fuimos violentadas sexualmente. En ese momento nunca hablamos. Hubo una ruptura de nuestra amistad porque fue más fuerte la vergüenza, el sentimiento que nuestra propia amistad. Seguimos asistiendo a clases durante una semana. Mónica nunca más regresa. A los tres meses Mónica se suicida. Yo dejo de estudiar y sigo con mi vida y en un silencio absoluto un silencio que carcomía cada vez más. El 12 de diciembre del 2004, fui acusada por el bloque Centauro de los Paramilitares, a mando de Jorge Arias Pirabán, de ser miliciana e informante de las FARC, y por esto me hacen un juicio. Cuando llego al lugar donde me iban a hacer el juicio, es algo cruel saber que habían cuatro hombres, que tenían toda la capacidad y el poder de violentarme como lo querían. Y efectivamente así lo hicieron. Ese día fui violada por cuatro hombres, empalada, torturada y secuestrada por este grupo, de lo cual llevo tres cirugías, secuelas de por vida, porque hoy quiero contar lo que muchos no quieren escuchar. Y es qué pasa después de... ¿Y cómo nos afectan? Porque es que violencia sexual no es solamente la penetración. ¿Por qué digo yo? Quiero contar. Quedé con dos enfermedades de transmisión sexual. De la, del empalamiento, quiero decirles que quedé totalmente abierta, anal y vaginalmente. Y lesiones de toda, por toda la vida, estigmatizaciones que también se derivan de esto. Es así como Ludirlena logra salir de Casibare Meta, donde se hizo uno de los grandes desmovilizaciones a nivel nacional y llega a buscar un servicio médico. Oh sorpresa que en la búsqueda de ese servicio médico me encuentro con un desconocimiento total de los funcionarios y una estigmatización a mí. ¿Por qué digo a mí? Porque yo no quise contar nada. ¿Por qué? Porque mi madre me enseñó que perder la virginidad era una deshonra para las mujeres. Y pues ya no valía, según mi madre. Y no la estoy culpando a ella. Después de esto, accedo al servicio médico porque me tienen que suturar, me tienen que hacer un proceso. Porque quedé con una enfermedad denominada gonorrea. Yo creo que todos lo conocen acá, ¿cierto que sí? Bueno, me hacen un proceso y yo oh, sorpresa que estaba embarazada. Embarazada de un niño que no quería tener. Pero que cuando fui al médico me dijeron, recuerde que si usted aborta, eso es un grave pecado y se va a condenar. El, por la, los antibióticos y todos, pues obviamente tuve un aborto. A los tres meses de ocurrido esto, nuevamente reaparece una enfermedad y ya denominadas condilomas. ¿Saben qué son condilomas? Las mal llamadas, o coloquialmente las llamamos cresta de gallo. De mi mente y de mi nariz no se borra el olor y el recuerdo cuando me estaban cauterizando a carne viva esto, porque estaba invadida. 
invadida de esto. Y siempre bajo mi silencio, y lo peor del caso es que el médico me decía, señora, y es que usted no conoce un preservativo. Y yo sentirme como una cucaracha, porque no quería explicar qué era lo que me había pasado. Y era mi derecho. Es así como acudo al intento del suicidio. Durante tres veces intenté suicidarme. El último me lleva a estar internada durante un año en un centro de rehabilitación emocional en el Hospital Departamental de Villavicencio Meta, en donde tengo que acceder a choques eléctricos para revivir neuronas en donde tenía que tomar diario ocho pastillas y una para dormir, y me alejé del mundo. No quería conocer nada, no quería recordar, no quería conocer a nadie. Un día escucho a alguien por la emisora decir que ella también había sido víctima de violencia sexual y que invitaba a que las mujeres rompieran el silencio y denunciaran. Ese día mi vida tuvo un éxtasis. Y les cuento que a los tres días mi madre fue a visitarme al control normal. Y ese día por primera vez le dije al doctor Galeano, quien era el psiquiatra, que me diera la oportunidad de salir de ese lugar que yo le prometía que nunca iba a regresar. Él en un tono de reto y de burla me dice, le aseguro que dentro de tres días vas a estar aquí. Pues les cuento que no, desde ese día mi vida tuvo vida. Y dirán, porque esta mujer me devolvió el sentir y el querer vivir. Comencé una búsqueda en todo lugar donde hablaran de mujeres, Ludirlena estaba. Inicié mi proceso personal y escuché y escuché miles de casos, miles de testimonios, hasta que tuve las fuerzas de romper el silencio. Romper el silencio es importante, pero más que romper el silencio, es importante que nos crean. Y les voy a decir por qué. Porque resulta que en esta búsqueda de ser escuchada encontré barreras. Barreras como llegar a buscar el acceso de justicia y me digan, pero sí fue tan grave lo que le pasó. Y yo entrar a cuestionarme incluso si sería así o de pronto es que yo estoy pues como confundiendo. Incluso entrar a decirme, pues la primera vez que fui violada tenía una pantaloneta y me dijeron, pero solo le quitaron la pantaloneta, no le quitaron nada más. Y yo decir, ¿y qué más querían que me quitara? Si me quitaron todo. Palabras como, y usted no intentó defenderse, que llevaban a que yo llegara a mi casa y dijera, ¿será que si yo hubiese gritado con mucha fuerza, alguien me hubiese escuchado y no me hubiera pasado esto? Fueron noches tristes y han sido momentos difíciles, porque eso no le pasó solamente a Ludirlena, ni le ha pasado. Le ha pasado a muchas mujeres con las que yo trabajo, muchas mujeres que su voz se coloca en duda, que su verdad le pasó a Mónica, porque si Mónica y yo hubiéramos tenido la capacidad de dialogar, incluso hubiéramos podido romper esa brecha. La verdad de Mónica, ¿quién la va a contar?, si yo hubiese logrado el objetivo en los tres intentos de suicidio, ¿quién hubiese contado mi verdad? Y así mismo como yo, hay muchas más mujeres allá afuera que sí han logrado el objetivo de suicidarse. Y muchas más mujeres que por esa estigmatización y por esa violencia asociada al género quieren callar, porque no quieren dar excusas ante una sociedad de doble moral, que sabe que está la violencia, que conoce las víctimas de violencia sexual, pero que simplemente le damos una palmada en el hombro y le decimos, agradece que estás viva. No, nosotras no queremos eso, queremos que se nos reconozca, queremos que realmente nos crean, porque ya estamos cansadas de seguir dando excusas o de seguir culpándonos. Es así como inicio el trabajo, se me da un reconocimiento, actualmente soy la mujer cafán 2019, esto no ha sido de Ludirlena, esto es de todas las sobrevivientes, no, perdón, las sobrevivientes, no, las víctimas de violencia sexual, porque es gracias a esa voz que hemos logrado ser escuchadas y gracias a nuestro empoderamiento y a esa fuerza y a estas mujeres hermosas que nos han dado la oportunidad que tenemos hoy en día, 
es que hemos logrado estos objetivos. Gracias. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here and also very humbled to be here and to speak after you, Rina. And uh, the importance of your story is overwhelming. And I know there are many other stories and I believe there are many other women present who have suffered sexual violence. And I'm humbled to be in their presence and I offer the philosophical ideas that I have uh, in the hope that these ideas will be useful to all of you in different ways. Of course, philosophy, I must change the tone now because philosophy is very general and often addresses itself to very abstract conceptual problems. May I just ask, can you hear me all right? It's not too... Good. Ludelina told us her story and honored us by telling us the truth of her story. But of course, we know it's part of her story that she was not always so honored and that her testimony was not believed, not taken seriously, for no doubt many different reasons, all of which we might think of as various kinds of prejudices whether it's tendencies to blame victims, to try to shame victims, whether it's a general stigma against people who've suffered sexual violence, or perhaps other reasons. But sadly, when victims come forward and are brave enough to say to someone, perhaps a personal acquaintance, or perhaps an institutional body, the police, or an employer, a court of law, when they're brave enough to say what happened to them, they will so often face this discreditation of being undermined either in their sincerity or in their account of the facts. Maybe they are misremembering, maybe they're exaggerating. What were they wearing that night? Why were you standing on that corner? Why were you there alone? These sorts of questions typically used not only here but elsewhere in many, many countries in the world when women try to offer their testimony about sexual violence, and it's a very a global pattern of undermining women's word when it comes to sexual violence. And so, I hope that this idea of epistemic injustice that I've put forward in earlier work will seem to you to have some application. It does to me, and I'm glad to Doris and others have seen a connection. So let me explain a little bit of philosophy, and then I looked forward to hearing from you in our questions and answers whether you find it relevant and what questions you may have. The general notion of epistemic injustice does not really matter. The word epistemic just means anything to do with knowledge and injustice. We all know what that is. So my thought when I first started writing this work was that there's a very distinctive kind of injustice which we all know happens, but somehow we don't have an easy label to pick it out when it happens to us. You're a woman who testifies to sexual violence but finds that her word is not taken seriously, is being undermined and insulted in her capacity as a knower, as a rational being who has some knowledge to give, but then she can't give it because it's batted back to her as her mistake or her exaggeration or her fault. And so she is blocked from putting into the epistemic community this knowledge that she has, this important truth that she has, that this violation occurred by this man or these men. And when that happens, she is being undermined specifically in that capacity as a knower and a giver of knowledge. And I thought that that was distinctive enough to be worth picking out with its own theoretical term. And in fact, I expect there are different kinds of epistemic injustice, and I've tried to talk about two of them, but today I'll just talk about one of them, which is our theme of testimonial injustice, and that is what's so relevant to the story we've already heard. Someone offers her testimony about what's happened, testimony is, as it were, 
a case of telling another person something in a solemn context where it's an important thing that is being told and yet finding that her word bounces back to her, rejected by the hearer because she's not taken seriously or we don't really care about these sorts of testimonies, so we're not going to take them into our system of beliefs and take them seriously. I think perhaps it's worth mentioning other kinds of epistemic injustice. I think of testimonial injustice as fundamentally a kind of discrimination that a woman is not believed because of a certain prejudice against women in that situation. It could be simply sexism and misogyny, but maybe if we're talking about testimony in relation to sexual violence, there are other prejudices we've mentioned already, victim blaming and shame and stigma that add to the situation. So fundamentally, testimonial injustice is a kind of discrimination. But there can be epistemic injustices which are not discriminatory. At least in Anglo-American philosophy, if somebody says the word gracias, injustice, people usually think about social distribution of goods. So they'll think about injustice in terms of, is this group getting their fair share of wealth? Is this group getting their fair share of health care? So it's about sharing out the social goods. And I think there can be epistemic injustice of that kind. Think of epistemic goods like education, like information, like access to expert opinion, legal opinion, financial opinion, access to the internet. All these are epistemic goods which somebody might not get their fair share of. So if you live in an area where no, there's no work opportunities, someone might stand back and, sorry, no education opportunities. Someone might look at that situation and say, this is a situation of distributive epistemic injustice. I think that's worth conceptualizing, but it's not what we'll be talking about today, which is more this undermining of someone's capacity to give knowledge, to give truth, in virtue of a kind of prejudice against them, a discrimination against them. Now, I think it's worth, whenever you try and theorize a particular kind of injustice, we should ask ourselves, what is the wrong perpetrated in this kind of injustice? What's the heart of the wrong that is done, the harm that is done to someone when her testimony is rejected through prejudice? Well, maybe the essence of the wrong can be not that serious on every occasion. I believe that the essence of the wrong of testimonial injustice is that someone is undermined in their capacity uh, to give knowledge and that giving knowledge is a fundamental way in which human, be human beings value themselves. So if, somebody, if I undermine somebody else in their capacity as a giver of knowledge, I'm saying they're less fully human than me. I don't have to count their words so seriously. And I think if you've been, if you have had the experience of being on the receiving end of a testimonial injustice, let's imagine not a serious case, not a sexual assault case. Let's imagine a fairly trivial case. Maybe I'm a teenage girl who is crazy about football and I know everything about football. And I offer my opinion about why one team is playing badly, the institution that should have happened. And the room full of other people don't listen to what I'm saying and they think, she's just a girl, she doesn't know about football. That might be something which in a way is not a very serious matter. Maybe this girl does not care very much. But I think when you experience that kind of prejudicial undermining of your epistemic status, it goes deep. You know that your word is being batted away, rejected, because of who you are, because you're just a girl. Or whatever. And so I think strangely, even in contexts of fairly trivial circumstances, we know the experience of being on the receiving end of testimonial injustice cuts deep because it cuts to our rational status, our status as human beings with the power to know things and to offer them to our peers. 
Now, if we go back again to a serious kind of case, and we imagine someone testifying to a sexual assault or some other kind of crime, then we, there we discover again that just being undermined in your capacity as a giver of knowledge can be a horrifying experience. And many women who do try to testify to sexual violence and who then are not believed, they, re they say afterwards, it was as if I was raped twice. There was the crime, and then there was not being believed. And they end up reliving this crime at the hands of a different party. And so I think that that is another reason to take the fact of not being believed profoundly seriously. I guess it's worth noting, too, that in this kind of experience of testimonial injustice, supposing it's me who is not being believed on this occasion, it's not only bad for me, it's also bad epistemically for the whole community. Because if you think about a community in which, in general, reports of sexual assaults are not taken seriously, then apart from anything else, this is a community which does not know its own practices. So you end up being in a society which does not know itself. It's hard to know your own social world. It's hard to know how life is for other people if you don't suffer those crimes. And so we rely for our knowledge of our own world on the flow of information from people who suffer those crimes into other communities. But if that flow of information is blocked by prejudice because we don't want to hear what they have to say, we don't like to think that this kind of thing goes on, then the whole society is epistemically disadvantaged. We don't know what our world is. We don't recognize what advantages we have if we're not suffering those sorts of uh, crimes. So there are epistemic wrongs to the individual and a severe epistemic disadvantage to the whole community if the flow of information is blocked in this way. But you might think, well, the actual essence of the epistemic injustice, the bit that's about being wronged as a giver of knowledge, maybe is not in itself as important as many of the secondary things which will flow from that injustice. Um, when I say secondary, I mean they are caused by the first injustice. So consider a case, again, of a woman who is testifying to having been sexually assaulted. What happens to her, of course, is that she is not believed, but what is caused by that? What results is that she cannot contest the crime. A rapist will go free, she has not been able to achieve justice, and no one else around here can see that justice is achieved, and so people will fear fearful if they suffer the same thing. And so the secondary harms of the testimonial injustice might be much more serious than the testimonial injustice itself. And I think that's important to bear in mind, because I don't want to stand up here and say, the whole problem is this very bad thing that happens is testimonial injustice. No, the very bad thing that happens is that people are raped and then they're not believed and so there cannot be legal justice afterwards. And so I think of testimonial injustice as a gateway injustice. If you suffer testimonial injustice, then there are many other things you cannot do. You are not only blocked from putting your information, your knowledge into the community, you're blocked from seeking legal justice. And so legal justice suffers from the testimonial injustice that the victims suffer. So I think this, I hope this idea of a gateway injustice helps us see how fundamental testimonial injustice is, so that this has to be fixed for other things to go right, but we can say that without exaggerating the importance of not being believed compared with the importance of getting legal justice after you've been a victim of a crime. They're all bundled up together and legal, injust legal justice depends on testimonial justice. 
So, I was talking to Doris uh, yesterday, and, and we, one, of, one of the aspects of the way I theorized testimonial injustice, and I've had some people criticize this in a very helpful way, is that I present testimonial justice always as credibility deficit, not being believed, getting not enough credibility so that you can't put your word out there. And some people have suggested that actually it's also an injustice to receive too much, an excess of credibility. And I've struggled with what the right way to think about this is, and perhaps you'll form your own view and you may disagree, but for me, I keep coming back to the idea that the point of theorizing epistemic injustice for me, is to find out where the wrongs happen. Who is wronged? And it's true that if you're in a situation where you have person A and person B, and you have to decide, do I believe A or do I believe B? Perhaps you're in a jury in a court of law and you have two witnesses who are giving contradictory testimony. Now, it's true that if you believe A because of some prejudice that makes you believe people who are tall or talk with that particular accent, so it's a prejudice that leads you to give them credibility excess, then it follows that you give a credibility deficit to B. Now that is true. But who is wronged? I say that the person who is wronged in this situation is B, because B is not believed when they should be, whereas A gets all the credibility. So although clearly I make a misjudgment of A if I believe A through prejudice, it's only B that I wrong. And I think the same can be said if you look at societies more generally. So one philosopher I, whose work I admire very much and who's sort of given constructive criticism of my view on this score is Jose Medina. And he explores the idea that we should, we should be less transactional, less, less focused on individuals, as I, as I do, and be more focused on society at large and see that, in general, these groups tend to get more credibility than they deserve, and these groups get less credibility than they deserve. Again, while I think that is clearly unjust, I want the theory of epistemic injustice to identify the people who are wronged by that structural inequality or credibility. And it seems to me that in any given case, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the people who are getting more credibility than they deserve, that doesn't necessarily wrong anyone. Getting too much of a good thing doesn't seem to me to necessarily wrong anyone, certainly not them. If anyone is wronged, it will be the people who are, as a result, not getting enough credibility. So again, I'm drawn to those who suffer the credibility deficit, not those who enjoy the credibility excess. And so for me, I would always think about where is, where is the poverty of credibility? That's where our focus should be. So. I've been talking so far about um, cases where people, are, people say things, they offer their testimony, and then because of prejudice, they don't receive as much credibility as they would, and perhaps the credibility goes down enough so that they really are not believed at all. There can be even more extreme cases than that, which is worth having on our conceptual map and we might call these cases of silencing. So there can be a situation, I think, a climate, a cultural climate, where the prejudices are such that some groups, and perhaps women in connection with sexual violence, perhaps they are such a group, are so stripped of credibility from the start that they can be in situations where when they try to offer their testimony and explain to others what happened to them, they aren't heard at all. It's as if they're just making a noise, making a complaint noise. They don't get that 
honor, if you like, of being listened to and actually being assessed in terms of how much they should be believed because there's just a deflection right at the beginning where you just hear, hear a complaint and you don't even, the hearer does not even begin to assess the credibility of their word. That, I think, can happen very easily in some climates where a group in relation to a certain crime just has zero credibility and it's something people are fighting against but I think it can create a special phenomenon of silencing, which is like the maximum kind of testimonial injustice. So you give your testimony, but it's not even received as testimony, it's just received as, as noise. Still more, we can identify something that I think it's worth labeling preemptive testimonial injustice. It's another kind of silencing Preemptive testimonial injustice happens when the powerful bodies, the institutions, care so little about what any of you have to say that they never ask you. There are, there are screens between what they want to hear and what you have to say, so you never even get to offer your testimony. Um, I think in situations where there is terror, where people are afraid to offer their testimony because of threats of violence. This is one example of preemptive testimonial injustice. People are not even going to begin to allow themselves to be asked or to begin to try to offer their testimony if there is a certain degree of terror and physical threat. So I think preemptive testimonial injustice is perhaps the most extreme kind of all. And Therefore, if we have a, I'm a philosopher, I like conceptual maps. I hope it's helpful. If we have a conceptual map of testimonial injustice, for me, it's a, a continuum. And at the most extreme end is preemptive testimonial injustice, where we know that none of those people will ever hear anything we say, and we daren't try to offer it because we are terrorized. That is the maximal case. Then there is the more sort of silencing case where you have some chance, but you're not really heard. And then there are all the other cases where the loss of credibility is, is great and then less great and less great and less great until up the end up here when a very small testimonial injustice is that someone has a small depression of credibility because of prejudice. And maybe with those kinds of testimonial injustice, they're not so serious. And yet, as I said, as in the case of the girl who's an expert on football, they still cut you deep because you know what's going on. You know that your word is not being heard because of prejudice. And that is always a deep kind of insult, even if it doesn't have many consequences for you in these circumstances. So there's the little map, a continuum, as I called it. I'd like to finish by broadening out a little bit to look at the political significance of testimonial injustice. Uh, depending on your conception of political freedom, it will have different sorts of significances. But there's a very interesting view of political freedom that I find myself attracted to, offered in particular by a philosopher called Philip Pettit. It's called Republican Conception of Freedom, where the word Republican is nothing to do with the politics of the USA. The word Republican is only to do with the kind of political freedom you have when you get rid of a monarch. So it's the Republic, Plato's Republic, that sort of freedom. And in this conception of what it is to be politically free, we have to not only uh, have a kind of uh, negative liberty in terms of not being prevented from engaging in certain actions like free speech or uh, economic behavior and so on. You have to be secure in your ability to exercise those freedoms. And the idea is that you have to be not, not dominated by any other person or agency in your society. So let me explain this Republican idea of domination and then we'll link it back to testimonial injustice. On this theory of political freedom, I would count 
as dominated, that's to say my status would be one of political domination, if it's the case that some agency can commit a crime against me with impunity, so they can commit a crime against me and I have no ability to contest that crime. So this theory knows that in every society crimes happen, wrongs happen. But what distinguishes the society in which people are free is that it is a society in which when you are wronged, when a crime is committed against you, there are some institutional channels for you to contest that crime where contestation is understood as a success idea that you really will get a fair hearing when you contest it. So to take a more, a less serious example, an example that isn't a crime but is, might be serious to me, supposing my employer fired me for no good reason at all just because she didn't like my hair. So this is a, an infringement on my liberty. Now, if there are channels through which I can contest her firing me for no good reason, so I can make a complaint to, my, to a tribunal that's in, my, in the board of my employer and I will be heard, then, okay, a bad thing has happened to me. I was fired for no reason. Maybe I'm reinstated. But I am not thereby dominated because she could not do that to me with impunity. Right? She did not have the right to simply do it to me. And this is proved by the performance of my ability to contest what she's done to me. So same with a crime. A crime might be committed against me. Now, if I don't have channels to contest it, I've suffered a crime and I've suffered this other thing, this domination. I'm dominated by the person who committed the crime against me because they can just do it on a whim, as if they were a monarch. Their, their word counts. So on this view, for a society to be full of citizens who are not dominated by the agencies in their society, we must have channels of contestation. Now, let's think about the different requirements for there to be channels of contestation. I talked about it being required that we have a fair hearing from our employer, or a fair hearing from the police, or a fair hearing from the courts of law. That requires, among other things, that that court, those police, that employer, are testimonial in just, sorry, testimonially just. They will hear your word without prejudice. Because if they have prejudices which depress the level of credibility when you try to offer your testimony about what has happened, then you cannot contest. And therefore, you are dominated. And therefore, on this theory, you lack political freedom. And so, I find this an interesting connection because it turns out, at least on this theory, that if our institutions do not have the virtue of testimonial justice, then we are not free, for we are dominated when people commit crimes against us. So it follows from this kind of view that the way to improve the situation is to keep working at our institutions to try and make those institutions more testimonially and just. So we try to and I know many people here are doing incredible work to open those channels of communication so that the information from women's testimony about sexual violence will flow. It's as if testimony is like water. You have to create channels for it to move. And if it's blocked, it will just go stagnant, can't go anywhere. It has to move in the system. And the institutions which are asked to listen to that testimony must be testimonially just, otherwise the crimes committed are cases of domination and these women are not politically free. And so I applaud all this work that I've been hearing about, women working with other women who are victims of crime and converting their own painful experiences into something that will help convert and transform the lives of other women to be able to share their stories and speak proudly about what they have survived and what knowledge they can pass on and what they can continue to demand from their institutions. And I merely offer the idea that one of the things it makes sense to demand is that the institutions 
are testimonially just. Thank you very much. Gracias. Vamos a abrir a preguntas eh, um, de ustedes. So, Primera pregunta. Yes, I can hear. Thank you. Hola. Bueno, mi nombre es Manuel Velandia. También soy una víctima. Soy homosexual. Estuve refugiado por 12 años en España. Y he regresado hace dos meses a Colombia. Mi pregunta es si usted ha intentado ampliar su construcción epistemológica a otras ontologías, por ejemplo, a las minorías sexuales. Como víctima homosexual, entiendo y he experienciado que nosotros no tenemos tanta credibilidad como los hombres heterosexuales. También me he encontrado, por ejemplo, en el caso de hombres heterosexuales que han sido violados, que sus mujeres no les creen porque asumen que si fueron violados fue por alguna razón. Pero también he visto que muchas veces, cuando hay esta injusticia epistémica, el arte, por ejemplo, es una alternativa de poder contar la historia. Por ejemplo, yo lo hago a través de la poesía o a través de la fotografía, porque, o las performances, porque permite que la gente reflexione sobre el hecho, porque pareciera que lo que afecta no es precisamente la epistémica, sino las emociones del sujeto con el que tú te encuentras, que no logra establecer un vínculo contigo para escucharte. Gracias. You're so right. These problems are very widespread, and I have tried in my own work to use different sorts of examples to at least make clear the different sorts of testimonial injustices, in, including in relation to sexual violence, uh, that men, gay men, and straight men suffer too. So you're absolutely right, and thank you for bringing that into the conversation. I I loved what you said also about uh, poetry and maybe art in general. And we're standing on Doris's amazing monument. One, one of the things that, because I'm a philosopher and I'm all words, I, I sometimes long for modes of expression where I'm not required to be precise all the time. And one of the things I love about art and poetry is that in some ways it has much greater power of a communicative kind, partly because it can tolerate a lot of ambiguity, many different meanings. And so it requires the viewer or the reader to come and draw the meaning up herself or himself. And in some ways, that activity being more active interpretation makes the, the did I do that? Sorry. Makes the material much more powerful. And as you say, uh, we human beings, the things we have to say are often emotional and emotion is a very powerful communicative tool. So even in words, we all know that rhetoric is something people use to try and bring their point home, make their point more forcefully. But I think in art and in poetry, the fact that emotion can be so inherent in the work adds to the communicative power of the art too. So yes, there are, there are many ways, many ways of trying to help one's community, one's society, take on new ideas and maybe we need we need words and we need art and we need poetic words and we need arguments we need all of these tools so thank you bueno, muchísimas gracias por su conferencia profesora eh, 
quería preguntarle en un contexto en el que la comunidad de oyentes está como muy lejos de convertirse en una comunidad de oyentes virtuosos, como tú lo mencionas en el libro, eh, esta comunidad puede ser una muy parecida a la colombiana, en donde, como lo acabamos de escuchar en el testimonio, los funcionarios de salud, la policía, hasta los mismos jueces, están eh, completamente sesgados por prejuicios machistas. ¿Cómo garantizar ahí el tema de la justicia epistémica si no podemos aspirar que ellos se conviertan en, en una comunidad de oyentes virtuosos? This is a very hard question. I don't pretend to know the answer. Let me try just to say something around your question. You're absolutely right that talking about developing greater virtues, whether it's as an individual or in our institutions, presupposes that enough people want that development to happen. And so, for those who are activists, many activists here, one way of interpreting part of their work is that they are trying to force, is a strong word, they're trying to work on institutions, create new institutions that uh, will be more testimonially just in certain ways, even if other members of these institutions or in, in other agencies in society are not interested. Um, so I think surely there is room for some optimism that there is work that can be done to help transform institutions even when there is not universal goodwill, even when there are battles against those who are happy with the status quo and who want the status quo to stay the same. But you, you probably have more answers than I do about, about this. I would, I'd like to learn from you about this situation, but, but I, I just want to say I, I think it's, it's possible and I know that people here are working and fighting to transform institutions in full knowledge that these institutions are full of people who are not very interested in change. I would like to do my, uh, uh, my question in English, so this is academic space. Uh, this is going to be controversial because the first part of the exposition says that every violent action should be judged by the point of view of the victim. But you were talking about a continuum of a certain amount of testimony and injustice. In a court law, in transitional justice, what do you think about the people that committed the crime? It's not possible to have testimonial injustice for the guerrilla, for example, because we were not thinking they are telling all the truth. How can we go to this balance? I know this is controversial because we, we, we have this natural uh, feeling in favor of the victim, but what about the other side? Thank you. It's important to ask these questions, and in fact, I didn't say and would never say that you always must believe any testimony of someone who claims to be a victim. I think in the case of sexual violence in particular though, there is a, and perhaps I can speak here more from my own country, the UK, and the situation in the US where I now live, um, I think there is still a kind of correction that needs to happen because there's been so much institutional discrediting of, of victims' word and so many institutions are struggling with how to correct for that without just saying you always believe someone who says they're a victim. Of course this can't be right. What, what seems to me obviously right is that every body who claims to have suffered such a violence must be listened to and their word must be assessed fairly right? and without prejudice. So for me, prejudice is the crucial idea. So in my head, at least, there is a clear ideal of what we want. And the ideal is that everybody's word, victim, alleged perpetrator, is listened to without prejudice. So, with, and, so without an excess and without a deficit of credibility. Now, what is difficult is to actually know in real life, what it is to follow that ideal. This, 
I do not know, but I, I believe that the ideal is fairly clear, and it's to get rid of prejudice in how we listen to the testimony of anybody. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Muchas gracias por su conferencia. Como buena filósofa, nos deja pensando preguntas mayores, no preguntas sencillas. Y la mía se refiere a cómo ve usted el proceso de transformación ideológico de una sociedad que está basada en el patriarcado. Una sociedad basada en el patriarcado menosprecia profundamente a las mujeres y también a los niños, porque no son creíbles. Aquí, eh, quien hizo la pregunta anterior, introdujo una palabra, que es la credibilidad, porque podemos ser escuchadas y los jueces se escuchan, oye, pero no creen. De, desde el principio no lo creen por ser mujer, o por ser niño, o depende de los intereses que muevan a ese juez. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos para lograr una sociedad donde los individuos que estamos en estos juegos tengamos la libertad? Que usted fue un concepto que trajo muy importante en su conferencia. Gracias. Gracias. More difficult questions. <laughs> I... How can we change? So the situation you described of patriarchal power, meaning that just because I'm a woman, I don't get believed, or just because I'm a child, I won't be believed. When that's the case, then for me, that's a case of total silencing. And I, I, I want to ask you, do you feel that this total silencing happens in every context? Or is it specifically in cases of uh, sexual assault? Because women must be believed about many other areas of life, right? So my experience of the way prejudice tends to work in patriarchy, in class-bound societies, in racist societies, is that um, I could be someone who has multiple disadvantages, maybe I'm poor, and still, in connection with my work, they will believe me, they'll believe me about when I finish my work, about whether the, whether the, whether the work was done in good quality and what the time is, and, but they won't believe me about things where their interests are challenged. And so I, I'd like to ask you whether you feel that under patriarchy, as you describe it, you think that women are not believed about anything, or is it just in certain areas of life, such as cases of sexual assault? Creo que asalto sexual tiene un condimento mayor, porque si se trata de un juez, aquí la mayoría son, si es un juez hombre, macho, en relación yes. con la víctima que ha sido asaltada sexualmente, entonces, y no ha, no ha tenido ese proceso que usted plantea, de formación, de educación para los jueces y los educadores, entonces la gran mayoría de ellos van a no creerle a la mujer y tratar de no, 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 no creerle realmente. Entonces, evidentemente es demasiado demasiada multiplicidad de casos. No podemos decir que es solo para un solo caso. La vida es, es diversísima, y, pero el patriarcado, que es la estructura global gigante, por lo menos en Occidente, no sé qué pasará en las culturas eh, orientales, pero en esta, el patriarcado es igual en Inglaterra, como en Estados Unidos, como en Colombia, con los matices según la cultura donde estemos. Entonces, no pienso que sea único. Eh, la respuesta para ustedes no es que crea que específicamente allí, incluso en casos de violencia sexual, también hay multiplicidad 
de veracidades y de injusticias que se cometen. Para mí, creo que el problema es la estructura general de pensamiento, la ideología en la cual se ha basado el sistema en el cual vivimos. Gracias. So, I think that part of, if I think of the progress there was in my country, in the UK, in Britain, where many of these same issues uh, occurred in different ways, women not being believed um, and women being blamed for their own victimhood and so on. In the last 20 years, there have been a lot of changes and I think uh, part of that, a lot of that is, is women campaigning, so activism to raise consciousness, raise awareness of what it's actually like. Another has been to work with political bodies and with the police to get training for the police to know how to deal with a victim of rape, what questions to ask, and certain protocols like always having a female officer available to come and talk with a woman, but a female officer who's been trained with how to take care of someone who's perhaps been a victim of sexual violence. So I think activists working with bodies in the police for training is very important. Another thing that has helped is more women politicians and more women lawyers because a lot of the campaigning in the legal profession, it's come from women who have been, who are themselves lawyers and high up in the judiciary who've brought these issues to the fore. So I, I guess this, you need many different many different pressures to try and improve things. None of them guarantees success, but activists working for better training and then getting more women in the powerful positions is the right direction. Gracias. Sí. El, el video de fragmentos está eh, en la sala de videos. Si lo quieren ver, no. Y uh, hay unos, uh, unas bebidas en las ruinas también. Gracias. <risa>